You're listening to Your Rivers Are Wrong, the podcast. My name is Merle. I'm here with my good friend Dante, and we're here to build worlds and tell their stories. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hello and good morning or afternoon or evening, whenever you may be. Welcome back to the Your Rivers Are Wrong podcast. I'm talking to you. Yes, you listening right now. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm one of your hosts. My name is Dante. And I'm the other one. And my name is Marilyn. And we're here as we are every week to talk about the wonderful whimsies of world building, the arts and aesthetics of setting up a setting and the telling of stories born from it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this is a special episode because it is our season finale. Yes, it we have is. seasons. <laughs> we have seasons. <laughs> um, very cool. This is um, the 14th episode, which is wild because that's what, three and a half months, three months, something like that. I mean, kind uh, that of. We've been yeah. at this. Usually a uh, series go for like 13 seasons, 13 episodes a season. But we're going 14 because we're overachievers. Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we will. Um, this is a heads up. We'll be taking a little bit of a break for a couple of weeks. Uh, we don't know when we're coming back yet, but we will have an announcement soon enough by next week uh, of when we'll be back. So we won't be gone too long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But before we talk too much about that, how are you doing, Merle? How's the week been for you? I'm doing okay. Bit bit ups and down, but things have settled a bit more. So that's good. And have taken a little bit more time to <laughs> re... How do you say that? Like recharge. Yeah. So that's, that's good. good. That's, that's good. been good. Yeah. And you also have some time off, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I basically took off today and the day prior. I just kind of reorganized myself. You know, I have, what is it? That's fair. Yeah. I got myself like a neat haircut. You know, I got went back to my usual place uh, because lovely, it's so hard lovely. to grab. <laughs> it's so hard to grab them during the weekend or like have time during the weekend to go. So when you go during a weekday, it's like, oh, you just walk right in. No line, no nothing. It's perfect. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love how, how the world is like suddenly really quiet and like there's room for just to like do random stuff if it's not like on a weekend or on a Saturday. Yeah. I always like have like more breathing, totally, breathing room kind of. Totally different energy. Yeah. Definitely. Like sometimes when I when I accidentally am free or something, I just shop or something on Monday morning. And I'm like, wow, this world <laughs> is just has all the room for me. It's like mm -hmm. I'm their special guest now. And it's really great. <laughs> yeah, you walk into like, you walk into like a like a bake shop or a cafe, and there's nobody there. The, it's, oh, just... it's specially made for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Other things I'm getting done, which is really nice. Uh, cleaned my room, which was satisfying. Mm. Really solid. That's good. Um, <laughs> working on taxes. <laughs> Because yeah. boy, that's a new thing for me. Trying to sort that all out. Like, fair enough. I'm. I'm usually I get help from like my family, like figuring it out. But this year, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it on my own, mm -hmm. and then you guys just check at the end. <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> Make yeah. sure I got it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at you, adulting and everything. Amazing. Oh man, it's ridiculous. It's too hard. I don't wanna. Don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Said every adult in the world ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like when you're a kid, you're like, oh, I wish I can't wait till I'm grown up. When you're I grown wish up, I like, could why do serious I... things like taxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out they're just boring and stupid. Yeah. Owning a house and, <laughs> and yeah. getting a big time job. Turns out it's just like, oh, wait, these are hard. OK. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a mood. <laughs> uh -huh. But anyway, we're here because we uh, want to talk about world building, uh, oh, yeah, our shared do. hobby. Yeah, that's why, <laughs> that's why we have this podcast, right? <laughs> I believe you're starting us off this week. Uh, do you have a topic you're sharing today? Yes. Yes, that's true. Yes, I have a topic. And I was thinking to talk with you a little bit about the idea of corruption. And Ooh. The, it's, okay. it's quite a specific topic, but I, mm -hmm. I think we can sort of apply it in multiple ways. And specifically how I ended up with this topic or thought of it is because I have, as you know, like we have started a new campaign or are going to start a new campaign with our sort of current group that we're both playing in right yep so i've been scouring the pinterests as you do <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, i realized dive that into I, the caves oh, of pinterest yeah. yes for sure <laughs> and um i've realized i have so many like very specifically named pinterest boards so so for the uninitiated <laughs> I noticed, like I saw a lot some. of pinterest like how i usually use pinterest is basically D D or design related stuff and because mm -hmm, Pinterest mm -hmm. is like such a treasure trove of character art, right? Of course, you should always credit the artist if you're going to use it for an official thing. But, of course, um, of course. Or, I mean, ask 
in <laughs> that's maybe more important than just credit. Like you should check if you can actually yes. use it. But if it's just for a private campaign, you know, you can just look at all the art you want. You can just use it as a mind image and mm-hmm. it's beautiful. And you get so many ideas from it. I always start with the art and then I'm like, okay, so how does this mechanically work? And what does this actually mean for somebody yes, that yes. I have to role play, right? But yes, I have been scouring the Pinterest, as I said, and I sometimes like end up in a specific spot or in a specific sort of idea in my mind that is, for Mm -hmm. example, called casual ghost friend. And then I just sort of scour and collect all the (laughs) art that sort of feels like that because it's a sort of idea in my mind. Right. And then some art sort of relates to it. And then at some point I just end up having like a massive board of just like little kids with ghost ghost friends that just have a tea party or someone that is sort Mm -hmm. of corrupted by a ghost and then you know all kinds of weird shit but then it sort of ends up in this very specific topic on my pinterest absolutely as one board of just an entire art collection basically yeah the on pinterest i never used to use pinterest i never saw the appeal of it before (laughs) playing D, &D. (laughs) but the the number of rabbit holes you start going down when you're looking Mm -hmm. when you're roaming or browsing through pinterest but you don't know what you're looking for you could be wandering for like uh-huh. hours. <laughs> yes, it's so true. Yeah. And yeah, those board names get kind of ridiculous. Like I, I have one that's less like purple bird people or something like that. And it's just like, this is the most <laughs> exactly. specific thing. It's the most random. Yeah. But there's it's a good handful of, of art for that. And it's just like, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> and I think it's uh, also the way Pinterest works, right? So if you find one kind of, I don't know, piece of art of... I don't know, somebody with a hijab or something. This this is also mm-hmm. what happened. Like I'm I turned out to make a hijabi board because I found a lot oh, of nice. cool people that wore hijabs. <laughs> and um so if you just start with a random picture of somebody with a hijab just to name something, it sort of recognizes the assets of the image, right? And then that's how mm-hmm. Pinterest uses its browsing to suggest you similar stuff, right? So that's yeah. why Pinterest is also so nice if you're looking for a specific thing or if you don't know anything and you're just like i kind of like this and then you can just from click to click right you get sort of closer to the idea you have which makes makes you sort of end up with a very specific pinterest board (laughs) (laughs) so why i was thinking of corruption to end this ridiculous side tangent here is because at some point i ended up with a board that's called casual ghost friends so this is like little kids (laughs) or like young people that look like they're having the time of their life. They're super cute and just casually having a picnic or stuff. Mm -hmm. But they also have a ghost friend in the sort of (laughs) most slice of life way possible, right? So it got me me thinking (laughs) kind of what corruption in terms of like, you know, you can, how do you say that, like close a pact or make a pact, I guess, with Mm -hmm. another kind of entity or something. That's a thing that's pretty like present in D&D or fantasy related stuff right i mean world building in general yes. i guess there's like a whole class for this in D. Mm-hmm. but very often it's this sort of deep dark thing of you know getting overtaken or getting possessed or selling your soul or you know stuff like that and i i'm so interested in this sort of breath of corruption that can also be part of that definition if you know what i mean not necessarily, you know, it doesn't have to be as upbeat as, you know, having a picnic with my casual ghost friend. <laughs> but but I'm, I was thinking, like, there's corruption of land, of course, but there's corruption of people or, you know, making mm. pacts, stuff like that. And I wondered if you have any ideas on this, if you, if you thought about it in, in the sort of wide way, I guess, that I'm describing now. Yeah, of course. Um, like, specifically in D&D, as you touched on, there's the class called the Warlock. The Warlock is somebody who makes a deal with an eldritch patron and... Mm-hmm. granted magic like yeah. at a cost at a, at a price like uh i'm gonna give you this power says the patron but you're gonna do this for me you know and it's kind of that descent into how much of the power is your own and how much can you control it is kind of the driving force of that story which mm-hmm. is always usually kind of deep and dark and spooky but it doesn't always have to be you know yeah and also corruption just in general is just such a common topic in anime you look at any like shonen anime where there's like a main character in a kind of adventure action fighting scene, there's always, always, always something like inside them, right? <laughs> From, uh, you, you look at like way back when, no, it's, it's way back when now, but it's what I grew up with. Like Naruto, main character has like a tailed beast inside them. Best friend is corrupted by like a, a curse mark that spreads across their body and gives them mm. these um, demony wings. Ichigo from Bleach has a hollow inside him that so that always fights for control. In recent times, there's Jujutsu Kaisen, where one of the characters uh, has a demon that he's always fighting to um, 
have control of his body. Uh, what else is there? There's Soul Leader. Soul Leader has um, the corruption of madness as a prevailing theme. Mm. Is being able to control yourself against the the likes of insanity and um, keep keeping a strong mental the entire way through. It's it's basically a visual manifestation of inner turmoil, right? Isn't mm. that kind of, or yeah, I like that definition. Self conflict, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Very often it's an outside source, yeah, but it's it's the triumph of yourself over it that is the prevailing story. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Also, I feel like the power of this trope, I guess, or this idea is also in its in the fact that it is so metaphorical. Like I mm-hmm. really love this idea in general, like even without the sort of whether or not it's like a casual chill kind of corruption. <laughs> but <laughs> which sounds weird if I say it like that. Yeah. But you know what I mean? <laughs> But yeah, I think I really like the idea in general because it's sort of, you can link it to a lot of emotional turmoil as well. Like it can be a very literal, or I mean, quote unquote, literal for fantasies, you know, standards Mm -hmm. (laughs) monster, or it can be a demon, or it can be, I don't know, an evil king that casts a spell on you and now you're cursed or whatever. The idea that you have to live with the sort of dark side of you or the dark side within you, I guess. It's something very interesting and makes it very easily bleed into like the personal or the emotional aspect of a character. And I think I really like that. Yeah, of course. One of my favorite tropes, I guess, in the in this kind of the realm of a uh, corrupted character is the maybe I'm jumping the gun here with the topic, but the resolution of the corruption mm. uh, in stories very often sits in the fact that they don't get rid of it entirely. Right. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. They struggle and they have pains and they argue with themselves the whole storyline. But at the end, the solution is not being rid of that corruption. It's not being rid of that external force, but adopting it and embracing it as part of oneself Mm. and redefining it into a strength is one of the best, like one of a, a classic and favorite story arc of mine. When you see the character towards the end of the series and they like have total mastery of the corruption that lays within them right Right. they start like wielding it as a power that they truly have control of like a self-actualization of oh this was never something i was supposed to be rid of this was a part of me Mm. and once i realized that how do i turn this to my benefit you know right and that constant seesaw struggle of like oh don't lose control don't don't cross the line don't be um don't be wild to like absolute mastery is like a is a transition into a more adult more um, evolved version of oneself yeah yeah for sure cool i feel like it's also a lot about morality or or something it also reminds me of the character arc of jester from critical role campaign 2 yeah spoilers um but (laughs) jester is a very happy sort of upbeat cute cutesy girl right she's the heart of the heart of the family basically everybody adores her that's kind of jester but she has this, she's not a warlock or anything, but the codependency of her relationship with the traveler, which is kind of the god uh, question mark <laughs> that she <laughs> worships or that she gets her powers from, really feels similar, not necessarily corrupted, but kind of like, hmm, is this good? Is this not good? Do I like, am I actually hurt or am I healing from this other person, you know, having influence on me, basically? And what I really loved yes. about that arc, because more spoilers, <laughs> <laughs> the Traveler always was her friend, I guess. And they had a sort of codependent relationship and it was a bit weird. Like, is it a friendship thing? Is it a family thing? It's a bit confusing. It's, is it like a worship thing? But then in the end, they sort of got to know each other and now they're friends. And, but they're still having this same power dynamic, I guess, even though Jester has grown more in power and she's grown wiser and older and m- much more powerful, right? Yeah, But the sort of removing the mystery of what the Traveler is also made it a very casual thing or a very chill thing. (laughs) Jester was always fine with it, but now we also understand kind of what the dynamic is, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what I love about the corruption idea is that the mystery is super intriguing, but also the the getting out of that mystery and sort of understanding what the actual situation is, is super interesting. Right. And I think in all of those aspects of that story arc, in whatever way you want to use it, right? Like there's tons of varieties on this. But all those parts of it 
I really, really like. And I like every twist and turn that you can take with this because the sort of getting to know something that's already inside of you is so interesting yes. and weird, right? Yeah. A prime example of exactly that is, um, again, for the the heralded anime Naruto, who, which is uh -huh. um, <laughs> force set sail a thousand ships in terms of like what shonen anime can do and shonen <laughs> manga can do. Uh -huh. The conflict of Naruto with the nine-tailed beast that lives inside him, which was deemed a monster to the community, a destructive terror, uh, was locked inside his body at birth when he was very, very young. So for a lot of um, the series, this nine-tailed beast was something that Naruto would have to kind of very Elsa like conceal, don't feel, like don't let it out. Sort oh, of thing. okay. You got to like contain it the entire time. You got to contain the power. Don't let yeah. it go loose. Don't go wild. But there's a point in the series where he has to accomplish some great thing, and Naruto goes straight like into his inner self, into his mental, and then meets the nine-tailed beast like in his mind and says, "All right, you're living inside of me. Like st you got to start paying rent." Like I need, like I need some of your powers mm, right. um, to to beat this threat. We have to work together to save the world. Interesting. And of course, Nine Tailed Beast is like, "How dare you make a deal with me? I am all powerful. I am yeah, in invincible." And Naruto is like, "Well, you're inside me now, so I need to do things. <laughs> if you're gonna stay in here, we got to work together." And what became like what felt like kind of the, a deal with the devil at first evolved into a partnership where hmm. um, the nine-tailed beast would start caring about Naruto and they would both start to work in tandem and their combined efforts made him into the greatest ninja to in the story. Like yeah. the, 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 the truly the main character to the point that in future, future, future episodes and series, people were endeared to the nine-tailed beast. People started getting to know yeah. his personality. His, That's his cool. I love that. Like he became kind of like a wizened uncle to or a, or a or a best friend to naruto like someone who could speak to in the back of his mind and and much 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 later in the series when the nine-tailed beast is lost it's a big hit to like the fans and the community is like wait he's gone gone like that's crazy like Whoa. he's been here literally from episode one right and it becomes a slow fan favorite like that transition into like mysterious evil terrible creature into a pillar of support is one of my favorite like uh, character arcs. Yeah, that's so good. I have to say, I know Naruto like by name and by how he runs. <laughs> and that's all I know about it. And that is like a big pop culture thing. <laughs> and everything else, I have no idea. So I should maybe actually like, like watch it. Maybe. <laughs> oh, it's a it's a long series. Uh, if you want to mm. sit down and watch a whole lot, it's like a just to get through the main storyline is like 120 episodes oh, or Jesus something fuck. like that. Okay, that's so. a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it unless you really want to. Then I'll watch like best moments of compilations, maybe. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, you could do that too. That's sure, great. sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, but that's cool. But yeah, that's cool. Also, because then I was thinking, like, why do I love it when it's when it turns casual? Like, why is that a thing that I adore? And I think that is because it's it sort of promotes communicating, mm -hmm. like in, in a way of like not everything that's cool has to be like dark and mysterious and like. How do you say that? Mysterious? Like brooding? wrestling? No, like, how do you say that? Okay, hold on. Combative? Yeah, kind of. Wait, let me translate this. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you going to Google this? Oh, friction. This? Okay, yeah, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Where did I end up? Hold on, let me, let me remember what. Yeah, I, I what was I couldn't saying? tell you. Oh, God. Okay. The thing I love about this something mysterious turning casual, I was thinking a bit as you were talking, and I think it is mm -hmm. because... Not every story arc, apparently, in order to be cool, needs to have, like, dark energy and friction and stuff to it. Like, a lot of storylines or uh, ways people start a story is by people not communicating and, you know, things being unresolved or, or people not liking each other or, I guess, you know, being at odds with people or, I don't know, a war being going on. It's always about sort of yeah. this conflict, right? And I like that something that is at first presented as dark and mysterious and forceful and, you know, evil at times and stuff like that, that it can turn into this very, I guess, good, good morals kind of character that is still very cool. Like, I feel like there's this idea going around in a lot of tropes and a lot of stories and maybe in real life in general, that in order to be cool or interesting, you have to be like dark or... You know, this is sort of the mm. edgelord idea where you're like, oh, I'm so edgy. Ooh, now I'm more interesting than <laughs> when I'm just a regular dude. Right. And I like sure. that the 
idea of something turning into like an actual good communicative relationship. Like the example <laughs> that you said about about Naruto, right? That that is still like very cool, and that that because of that, it turns into a fan favorite. I think that's mm. so fun, and so like it has like the message now that like if you actually communicate and be friendly, then good things happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Even though we're talking about like a dark, mysterious monster entity, right? Yeah, that's super yeah. fun to me. Yeah, if you ever find yourself in the presence of an eldritch spirit, you know, just in your daily life. Yeah, hand uh, them a maybe, cupcake. Maybe, <laughs> maybe just talk to them. Maybe they're just misunderstood. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, I think that's, I, I love, I love that whole trope. I love that whole, like, thematic. It's so satisfying, right? I don't know. Yeah. Like, the fact that it's like a whole separate character and it's a reoccurring character um, that you get to interact with. And it's not only a reflection of, like, a partnership, but also self actualization yeah 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 for sure and it's something that's way harder to like turn into an evil something right because it's inside of you like if Mm. you're like judging it you're also sort of judging yourself so it's not easy to be like oh yeah the evil king in the castle oh you have to fight them and then they're dead and then stuff is happy end of story right but if it's Mm. inside of you you can't say that because that's making things already purely like physically way more impossible and tricky to to sort of condemn something evil like that because it's inside of you and part of your body, I guess, or your spirit or mind. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Interesting. That's kind of all I had for this. I just <laughs> so wait, really did, like this topic. So wait, did you find a picture? Like, of all, after all that searching, did you <laughs> find it you're looking for on Pinterest? Well, <laughs> this is the trouble with Pinterest. <laughs> if you are sort of kind of there, but not quite, you just keep browsing and you keep adding stuff to your board and then you're like, wait, what was I searching for? <laughs> <laughs> so kind of this is why my character building takes forever because i'm like ah, that's not quite there yet no that's valid yeah yeah i should maybe like remove half of the pictures again and then be like okay so how do i continue from this <laughs> yeah i mean we're getting there but it's not yeah i gotta think about it more <laughs> yeah 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 okay sure um should i jump to my topic yeah sure cool what did you bring um now we've talked about this actually twice before um in prompts that we've handled in previous episodes Uh, But I kind of wanted to give it its own topic and a little bit of breathing room. Okay. The topic that I want to talk about today is flight. Uh, The powers Ah. of flying, the wonders of flying, uh, and what it means from a storytelling aspect and as a world building prerequisite, so to speak. So just in general, flight is something that is very coveted, right? I, I think that's I think that's the word I'm looking for. I think I think the way I want to approach this first is that if nobody has flight and mm-hmm. one person does, it's special, right? Yeah. And if everybody has flight, the world revolves around it. Yeah. I think that's I think that's kind of the approach I want to go at. Okay. Because okay. so I kind of want to discuss just in general, like why why flight is such a prevailing topic? Because just to bring up a couple of examples, right? Uh, we got Disney's Peter Pan. We have Dumbo. Oh, yeah. We have Studio Ghibli's Kiki's Delivery Service. We have mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. examples in Avatar, the development of flight from people who are not airbenders. We have Dragon Ball Z, where the series starts off nobody being able to fly and then everybody being able to fly. <laughs> just shooting through like the air. Yeah. And that there's um, these, these are just kind of the examples I have listed. And of course, well, not of course, but one of my, one of my favorite series, Drifting Dragons, is a series that starts and takes place in an airship and the um, the lifestyle that develops of, from that. So uh, I kind of want to toss mm-hmm. it to you first. Um, why do you think we love flying? Like, why do, why are people so invested in flying to the point that all of these stories are being written about it? Like, what, what shoots off to you first? Yeah, um, I think for starters, I guess it's just the movement and the idea of wanting to do something that we can't do as humans Mm. because we see like examples around us that are able to do it basically all flying animals right or i don't know airplanes stuff like that and i think why we love those animals can very much be why we love flight and why we want to how do you say that like wallow in the idea of being able to fly if Mm -hmm. i talk for myself i just love the sort of peter pan kind of flying through the air and doing like spinning and stuff, <laughs> you know, kind of like that. I love that particular idea of flying. So not necessarily like with wings or with like, I don't know. Mm. Jets of air. Yeah, jets <laughs> of air. I was thinking like, what are the alternatives? But I guess like the sort of bio slash mechanical ways of doing it. Like I love the sort of purely 
imaginative sort of floating and darting through the air idea. Mm -hmm. I think it's because it's also mysterious in terms of a world that we don't quite know. I mean, we can kind of pass through it. We can photograph it. You know, we can, I guess, traverse through it in terms of like airplanes and stuff. But the whole sort of third dimension in terms of like up and down, we don't usually scale it. I think at some point when hot air balloons were invented, and also that was around the same time that photography sort of got big, there was one guy, I forgot his name, (laughs) because I'm not good at names. (laughs) You want me to Google it? I can Google it. That basically made the first air photos, I guess, or like Google Maps kind of like photos of Paris, of France from the air. And people were super enamored by it and obsessed over it because no one made photos like that before. Nobody ever saw that perspective earlier because, you know, people weren't weren't able to like get to that height before, let alone like photograph it or have like art pieces, I guess, or representations about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super interesting. And specifically that idea of perspective. (laughs) I had this like yesterday, by the way, where I'm like, wow, I'm so tall. I'm looking down on all the things (laughs) that I own. (laughs) And oh, before okay. I was like, I wait, thought, I thought you were like, I thought, <laughs> you caught me off guard. I thought <laughs> you were looking at like a crowd of people and were like, wow, I'm so tall. Oh, I mean, <laughs> like, wow, that's also a good thing. For, but... Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes I just have this realization that I'm like, wow, a lot of things that I own or that are in my room, I don't know, are like lower than my, my eye level. That's Which so is weird funny. because I remember like being as a kid, you have to like look up to everything. I don't know. I just had this moment at some point. This is so, this is such a side tangent, but I, I know I need I need to comment on. I need to <laughs> right. Um, the fact that everybody from your country is just generally taller than the rest uh-huh. of the world. Yeah, that's just that's just an established fact. Yeah, like, it's true. I think your I think your average height of like <laughs> guys and girls is just like five or six inches taller than everybody else. Yeah, I guess so. Mm-hmm. Something in the water, I'm sure, but. <laughs> So when you said, wow, I'm so tall, I'm like, yeah, you think? You think? <laughs> no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. I remember, oh, maybe we already talked about this, but I remember that when we, when I made Bryn, the first character mm-hmm, that we mm-hmm. did for our campaign one that we were both playing in, I made her like kind of my height, a little bit taller, I think, but like, I think she was like 5'10 or something or 5'9. I'm mm-hmm. not sure. I don't know, feet and inches. Yeah, <laughs> I, th- yeah I think 5'10-ish. Yeah, something like that. And then we made like a height chart just for fun. And then I was like, Jesus Christ, why is everyone so tiny? Why is it? Why is this a thing? We're not. And they were like, we're no, you're just tall. <laughs> and this is the first time I was like, oh, right. I'm not like average world height. I'm just average like like the Netherlands height, <laughs> which is a thing, I guess. Yeah, it's so funny to me. Oh, my God. Yeah, uh, I love how, how like in, <laughs> this is such a such a tangent, but it's a fun one. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> how like in in D anD D, everybody like takes their own height and then chucks a couple inches on top of it, uh, I guess which so, is yeah. just the average height of people in the Netherlands. But it's also... <laughs> <laughs> just makes me ridiculously tall in everybody else's eyes. Yeah, yeah, Fair yeah. Enough. I remember yeah. I remember in campaign two, we just had characters that were like straight up six seven. 610. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like sc- sc- I think I was one of the ev- tiniest ones because I learned from my mistake. <laughs> like the party was just a, a room full of skyscrapers. It yeah. was so funny. Yeah. Fair um, enough. <laughs> but yeah. Um, what were we talking about? about oh, flying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so while we had that little tangent <laughs> right, about the Netherlands, right. I did find the photographer. Oh. I'm going to murder this lame because uh, I don't speak French. So I'm just okay. going to pronounce it as I would as an American speaking American, <laughs> you know. Which is uh, what? G- uh, Gaspard. Felix Torna Tornachan Tornacon. Oh, fair um, enough. Yeah, I'll, I could dump it in. I could dump it in our chat. Uh, sure. Pseudonym Nadar. Uh, 1858 captured the first aerial uh, photographs photographing Paris from a tethered balloon at right. an altitude of 1600 feet. Yeah, I would have. Of course, these are amazing, right? Right. Like, That's unless cool, you right? have a yeah. tall hill near your town, you're <laughs> never going to see what this looks like. Like skyscrapers. But then still, like you're never on top of it. You're most. always sort of gazing at the side of it if you're standing on a big mountain because like exactly. the mountain itself is not the city. You still have like a few miles to go before you can look at something else. Yeah. Yeah. So like looking at look a top down view of your city, like literally never. Yeah. Like, you would not have a real photo of that. That's so, so cool, right? That humans amazing. until like 18, what did you say? Like 18 something never saw their city from above. Like the way that we know like Google Maps now. That's so wild exactly, to me and so fun. Yeah. So I was looking up, uh, kind of looking into articles like why, what is this obsession with flight, right? Mm-hmm. And I found a like a word that really kind of encapsulates it for me. Like oh, okay. um, the word is unconquered. 
Um, mm. The sky, we see it every day. We see the beauty of the colors of the sky, the clouds above us, the storm, yeah. the weather. Right. But it's so out of our grasp that it's easy to get caught up in the dream of being there, <laughs> seeing it, like being with amongst the beauty of the sky above us, right? Like the word unconquered is just so perfect because it's like, yes, we can get up there with planes and we can get up there with like with like parachutes and hot air balloons and stuff like that. But we don't truly own it, right? Yeah, you'll always fall down eventually, kind of, yeah. It, we can't stay there. It, there's no permanent suit. It's always a temporary endeavor to be in the sky and be amongst the clouds, you know? Yeah. So all of these stories, uh, I noticed as I was kind of looking into it, a bunch of them treat the power of flight as a gift that you have to reconcile within yourself to use. So we look at uh, Peter Pan. Yeah, which is right. Kind of a, Think happy thoughts a, kind of idea. Yeah, yeah, happy thoughts. So Peter Pan is happy thoughts, wonderful thoughts. A Kiki's delivery service. She loses her power somewhere in the middle of it. And mm-hmm. she can't fly on her broom anymore. It's mostly because of the self-doubts of like what she should be doing with her life. Like what, who is yeah. she and what does she want to accomplish? That's interesting. And yeah. Towards the end of the movie, she regains it. You look at, what do you call it? Dragon Ball Z. Um, there was the whole episode dedicated to teaching like the youngest members of the cast, like at that time, Goten and Videl, um, how to fly, right? And it was just kind of a concentration thing, mm. the concentrating your key and pushing it up. Sure, yeah. But like the fact that people kind of gain these powers of flight and there's a kind of a freeing aspect and then they lose them is almost always when used in a story beat as a testament to your own self-doubts or your own flaws mm. or your, um, you look at a movie, yeah. one of my favorites, um, How to Train Your Dragon. They spend half the movie oh, right. yeah. um, retooling Toothless, who is, a, who is a flightless dragon because of his injury, um, how to fly. And the only way he can fly is through a partnership and a team effort with the writer, who is, um, gosh, why am I forgetting his name? Hiccup. Oh, Hiccup. Yes, Hiccup. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that like to be able to fly again and to be where you were back, where you were once before, requires the help of another like that's just that's just a beautiful story beat in itself, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then as we always do, we could tie it into Avatar. There's a character called uh, Tio, Teo, who lives in the air temple, but is bound to a wheelchair. So as people, oh, yeah. as, as someone who wants to rejoin the community, he retools his wheelchair into a glider that can capture the skies and get a, the power of movement that was never capable, like mm-hmm. with his own legs. Yeah. It's truly like uh, ascending above yourself sort of moment. There is such like, a beautiful aspect to flight where we kind of correlate it in our own mental space to an improvement above your own trials and tribulations, right? It's mm. a, it's a visual, like the same way that corruption is kind of an argument and a reconciliation with your, with yourself. Yeah. Flight is kind of a uh, very much the same thing. It's kind of the result of you understanding um, who you are and what you want to be or um, reconciling one of those deep, deep dark demons inside of you. So, Strangely, yeah. uh, wow, very, that's really very nice. similar. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. I was thinking as you were talking also about how, I guess, culturally and historically, also flight has a lot of ideas of ascension, right? Both literally and like mentally. Like the mm-hmm. idea of like being enlightened is a thing, or literally, I think the Buddhist way? Question mark. I'm not sure, so good at sure. my religion, but there's this thing where you like. If you meditate for forever, you literally sort of ascend or the idea that we think of heaven as the place that you go to, or I mean, in Christianity, at least I should say, Mm -hmm. the place that we go to if we did good in our, you know, mortal, usual life, I guess, (laughs) you know, the idea that angels are sort of heavenly beings that are purely good and wait for you if you did well enough, blah, blah, blah. But also quite literally, like you can literally hover above everything that you know, if you can fly. So the Mm. sort of unknown floating i guess is really it's like you're sort of swimming in a swimming pool and you have that feeling where your ears are sort of in the water so you don't hear anything Mm. that feels similar to me that feeling of sort of oh i'm alone in this sort of strange other dimension now that really attracts me to it and i think that's also why the idea of overcoming yourself or being like perfectly centered or thinking happy thoughts or being in balance Mm. causes the fact that you are able to fly or that you start to learn it or whatever yeah yeah. I, yeah, I think that's that's actually a really interesting point that flight is kind of tied to or or just the sky in general is tied to divinity. Right. Um, like, yeah. could, could you imagine like the there, there's a bit of a clash of aesthetic if you if you want to flip it and say like, oh, hell is in the sky. Heaven is 
deep below the earth, right? Yeah. There's kind of like a cognitive dissonance, like, no, the good stuff is up there, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. So, so um, that is, yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting point that like we've always associated the sky to be quite a, yeah, what you said, a literal ascension, like a, a figurative and literal ascension. Yeah. Where it is, the a betterment of self lies higher. Yeah. Right? And it also reminds me like even in art disciplines and stuff or or the the idea of the fact that ballet dancers, like the whole discipline of, of ballet is basically, you know, spe- specifically for the females, I guess, in there, the sort of reaching and the feeling of weightlessness is super important mm-hmm. there, right? And the fact that why they're literally on their toes while dancing is sort of the whole idea of that. Or the idea that that I think has been described in the Bible and maybe also in other like religious books, I'm not sure. But the myth of like the Tower of Babel, right? Where people mm. just sort of build and build and build and I don't know, almost like get rid get of the earth that God. they're on. Yeah. yeah, sort of literally get closer to the heavens and think that they're capable of it because they have the power or not. And I guess they didn't in the Tower of Babel. Oh, of course. God was like, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and of course, uh, what is it? The, 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 the myth of flight, the story of Icarus. Um, wings oh, made yeah, of wax of flying Didn't too close to the sun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this isn't like a recent advent, right? This is something that's trend- that's been around for centuries and yeah, centuries. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so interesting. I think it's always so fun. It it was it's been on my mind, which is which is kind of dumb, but for D and D reasons, how um how flight is something that is a very valuable resource, you know, in a game that that ex- that is played mostly on the ground. Any character that has flight has a significant advantage. Mm-hmm. So, and um, there's a weight attached to it that you only hit the ability, you only gain the ability to fly at certain levels, which is like level five, level seven onwards. Mm-hmm. And any character that's born with it, like uh, like the bird folk or the fairy, things like that, they have an advantage straight from the get go. So I'm like flight, even mechanically, right? Not not even like in a in a abstract story sense. Mechanically, flight is an advantage. It's an it's an ability. It's a capability yeah. that that elevates you above the rest. And I, and as I said right at the start. If everybody flies, the world is built around it. If one person flies, they're special, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's almost always, always, always a story beat if they can. And just uh, just a very quick touch upon, because this has been going on for a bit, the world building around flight is just so interesting, right? Floating islands, <laughs> airships, oh, yes. um, vertical Floating mountain peaks. Islands, I fucking love those. I don't know why. And when, when like the waterfalls sort of evaporate into like... D- dust and where does mist the water come stuff. from where does doesn't matter i don't care doesn't matter it's beautiful doesn't matter i'm so happy whenever there's a floating island anywhere doesn't matter if the rivers are wrong right they just water looks beautiful right <laughs> yeah exactly like the other avatar movie like the blue people avatar movie where they have the floating islands <laughs> the and avatar. i don't even know if i like that movie and there's so many controversy about it and the second movie never comes and i hate it and it costs so much money <laughs> but the floating islands you know count me oh, fucking in it's island. so beautiful i love it it's I'm completely convinced by this trope. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, why live on a floating island? Why not? It's exactly. a floating island. <laughs> That's literally why I world built for people that ask, like, why should I not be making this amazing thing or living oh, on yeah, this amazing exactly. thing? Exactly. And the, and the way the world transforms around it, the hierarchy of flying, being able to fly versus not being able to fly. The gliders, the vehicles, the the mounts. Yeah. Like you think of all of the creatures that they tame just so they can conquer this island and <laughs> uh, benefit from its resources. Oh, there's always something rare there. There's gemstones. Sure. There's flowers. Of course. There's uh there's wildlife. Things that like you could never find on the ground, of course, mm-hmm. because no. this is a safe haven. This yeah. is uh, truly a perch above above the world. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Gosh, so one beautiful. of my favorites. Always so beautiful. It makes for such easy world building also. Like you're instantly like in the mindset of how do we fix this thing? Because it's so like unusual and hard to yeah. like put into like a traveling society. Or I don't know, how do we even go up there? Like there's like architecture needed for that, you know? <laughs> and then exactly. before you know it, you're world building. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Like, look, you're. I'm not talking to you, Marilyn. I'm talking to the people listening. You're listening <laughs> to this, right? And when I said floating island, you saw something, right? You knew <laughs> exactly something appeared in your mental and you know exactly what I'm talking about. That it's <laughs> you like know a mystical, you <laughs> magical world, if not like a flying metropolis. It's mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah. It just inspires so much. And it's just our natural wonder of the skies of flying <laughs> that makes that so appealing. It's again the mystery, right? Like the fact that we don't know it and the fact that it's not conquered and the fact that we keep falling out of it mm. makes us, I guess, even more eager to get back in it. Yeah, like we well, this twenty year of twenty twenty two, we have not 
conquer the skies, right? Yeah. We have planes. We have all we this. See we see it every gliders, day. We have all it's this so stuff. big. Like, why can't we stay in it? Yeah. We truly don't live in it. So like a hundred years from now, someone listening to this podcast, of course, which will still be on I Spotify. I mean, space is a thing. Let's <laughs> not forget like about space. Yeah. But <laughs> okay. Okay. Disclaimer. That's space is a whole, space is a whole nother thing. But it's it feels different. Yeah. It's not thing. like a society yeah. kind of, it's, it's too far and too hard. <laughs> But like, yeah, but to close this out, like we're just visitors in this in the sky. Yeah. We're not we don't live there. Yeah. And in the future, it'd be cool. If that was something that changed, you know, mm. it's very humbling. I'll give them that. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Humbling. All right. That's a good way to wrap that one up. Wow. Interesting. This can go so deep. We should like revisit this. Even more. We, we I feel have. like we keep turning this back to this one. This is the third time. Yeah. This is the third time we've talked about. I want to talk about it more, though. Like there's so much here. Oh, yeah. We could, it's great. We'll bring it back. In season two, well, because <laughs> when mm-hmm, we come back, mm-hmm, yep. uh, we'll come back with some cool stuff. Dun, dun, dun. Anticipation. <laughs> so this is, again, this is, again, our, the episode is our season finale. So this will be the last prompt mm-hmm. until we take a break. Yes. And I believe, Merla, you're the one bringing it to the table. So it's true. It's true. I always, <laughs> I almost, as we were talking, wanted to switch it to like, what does it mean if heaven is in the ground and hell is in the sky? <laughs> Which is pretty season two, good. Season two. Yeah, we, should, we should save it. We should save it. Okay. <laughs> this is the anticipation <laughs> part. Yeah. But I thought about another one. Very not related, I guess, but interesting nonetheless. Um, sure. And we can just talk about it. Uh, or if you have like a super good idea, you can just ramble on and I will just be in awe of whatever you think I'll, of. Listen, I'll ramble no matter what. <laughs> Fair enough. Me. That's what we do for like 45 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Here we go. It's one sentence. And this is the prompt for you. Oh, boy. Everybody boarding the ferry will die. (laughs) But only the ferryman decides who is sort of allowed to get ferried over. That's the prompt for you. Gosh. So do you want to like talk about this? You want me to make a story of it? Like, what's the game plan here? You can just like phrase your ideas. We'll, we'll, We'll just bounce off each other. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So first thought that comes to mind. Um. Why are they getting on this ferry? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. What's the Good reason? Point. What's the reason? Is this like something that comes with the branding of the ferry? Like everybody who gets on will die. Like I would be very difficult <laughs> to get some it. sign up. So, so there has to be a reason, right? Which which begs the question, like what's the destination, right? This ferry is clearly going somewhere important to the point that it's worth dying for mm. or it's worth risking dying for. And if the ferryman gets to decide who gets across, what's the criteria? Yeah. Fair enough. Um, if this was like a Greek myth, it would be a test of morality, right? It would be like, why are you going to this destination and people pure of heart or whatever um, sure, would sure. be the people who make it across. Yeah. You know, like think of it like, I don't know, the arrival in Atla- to Atlantis or El Dorado or anything like that. You know, mm, city yeah. of gold. OK, OK. Uh, yeah. Why do you want to visit? You know, uh, if one person says uh, to, to take pictures. Sure. Cool. One person says, I want to steal the gold and go back home and be rich and a king and stuff like that. No, they die. You no, know? thank you. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I could I could see that being the storyline. Um, also begs the question, who are the ferrymen? Like, what gives them this right? Why? <laughs> oh, I like that. They, OK. Like, uh-huh. why? What makes them so important? And they could just be like humble servants of a god who. Um, sure, sure. Who tasked them with this and they have they have no other stake in it. That's just what their life is. Um, but they have this kind of power. Ooh, if we want to tie it back, um, are they corrupted? Like, do they have ulterior mm. motives? Are they fighting with something? That's um, interesting. For me, it's literally like the way I thought about this, at least. But yeah. I like the direction already that this is going in. Mm-hmm. I saw the ferryman as kind of the people in between. So in between the destination. So they don't have any other function, maybe almost like not even humane, than to sort of literally ferry people over. But the fact that not everybody gets to ferry over gives them a very important position in this, you know, destination A, destination B, right? Yeah. So they can kind of be like the impartial judges. I guess so. And the interesting thing that you mentioned, like, why would even people want to go here? Or like, what does it offer besides like death? (laughs) Or why would you want to? (laughs) Either it's it's the sort of literally passing because people die anyway, right? Like, would you want to die in a sort of very special way? Like, does this provide an experience so beautiful that it's literally the best way to go or something? Ooh. <laughs> Come now, it's literally the best way to go. Yeah, you could you could die from a terminal That's illness a or you could ride a very beautiful boat to a very beautiful place and pass away there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I could see that. I don't know. Or what if people, like, if we're tying it back anyway, like, what if people believe in heaven or believe in God or believe in a sort of afterlife 
What if they mm-hmm. see death or advertise, I guess, if you could call it that, advertise mm-hmm. death, not in a like, ah, your body stops working and now you're dead. But in a way of the destination is the afterlife. So you will, quote unquote, die mm. if you board the ferry. Then it becomes suddenly oh. very attractive, right? Well, I do love that. Um, like uh, we could talk about like the river Styx, you know, the, the Grim Reaper on a ferry boat. Oh, yeah. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because I feel like I know this, but not really like, yeah, well. I, I kind of know it in passing, only the visual aspects of it. But mm. the, the, the river Styx is a, probably comes from mythology, the East, right? Or I've or seen it, no? yeah, I've, or I've seen it mentioned in like, obviously Japanese anime, love it. Oh, but okay. it's basically the, the I only know of, it like of Hades Town. That's fair. The musical yeah. where they, so I guess it's also in a Greek thing related. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's basically the you can correct me if you if you are more familiar of course just sure. send it in the comments your river is wrong at gmail dot com. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the river sticks is the passageway or the road that leads you to the afterlife. Pretty oh, darn sure that's what gotcha. It is. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of similar. Yeah. yeah. That's so interesting to think that like the people on the or boarding the boat uh, are getting on because they expect to die or like because this is how. This is how people die. This they they get on the boat and they yeah. pass away. Um, the the point that they're like there is no destination in that you don't expect the boat to reach somewhere, but rather you will simply it simply takes you to mm. the end of your life. Yeah, there's got to be a story about that, right? There's there's got to. It be. feels like I feel like also I didn't think of this myself. Maybe I subconsciously like remembered the Strix, uh, Strix mm-hmm. River thing. I'm not sure, but I love it anyway. Yeah. Also specifically because the ferryman has such power, right? If they sort of shun some people out like like say okay you you can't go on and you can board i guess it's mm-hmm. huge impact even though they're just like they don't gain anything from it yeah that's fair um here i looked it up because we were definitely pulling this from somewhere in greek mythology Car- caron charon c-h-a-r-o-n okay um is is the ferryman of hades who carries souls oh. to the of the newly deceased who have received the rights of burial across the river acheron uh, or across the river Styx that divided the world of the living from the world of the dead. Hmm. So yeah, so this is kind Fair of enough. where we're yeah. pulling this from. Interesting. So you kind of get on the boat because you've passed away. And once you have, your soul kind of boards it and you are brought to the afterlife. Right, right. That's what I'm getting from this. Hmm. It's such a visual. I think I think there's a there's an intrigue into what it looks like. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and people always sure. talk about like what what it looks like to pass away, like the blinding light, seeing your world, their life flash before your eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is a very visual thing where like you have a, a boat being brought, like the Grim Reaper basically carrying you by boat. Um, you have that time of reflection to think about like where you've been, what you've done, where you're going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a time to, again, an, another another introspective look. Um, as we have been talking about this entire, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, this entire episode. It's a mo- motif, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess so. For for me, although you did say like they're kind of an impartial voice in all of this, the ferryman is just a good, just a good con, just a good character that I believe deserves characterization. Which it would be so okay, interesting okay, to see well, their perspective. You know. Yeah, I was gonna say like, do you have an an idea about them, or what interests you most about it? Uh, my, my gut just tells me that like something like this, it, it, they were either punished to do this for the rest of their life or created to do this. So, mm, okay. um, yeah. it's, a, there's a possibility they don't know any other life. They don't know what it's like to be like on the world of the living or the world of the dead. They simply mm. live in the crossroads between. So That's what what would happen job. if they like get off the boat? Right. <laughs> what, what would <laughs> that's that's a great question that's even a better prompt yeah. holy shit i yeah. should have thought of that so, instead <laughs> what's the life of a ferryman <laughs> yeah what if what if they step off onto the land of the living what if they just stay there yeah what if like what happens to all of the souls what happens well, to nobody the die ever the again afterlife? yeah oh god yeah this if, is breaking if up this all is a of responsibility stuff. that falls truly on their shoulders right hmm. i would love to read a story about this to be honest like just what the ferryman if the, in particular yeah like yeah. what if during their <laughs> adolescence they're like i don't want to be a ferryman who do you think you are to <laughs> condemn me to this faith i'm gonna chill with my other friends and have a <laughs> life on earth yeah i love the idea that they they kind of like on day 3005 right um <laughs> they take they take on a soul ready to progress to the afterlife and they just listen in on a conversation of something just beautiful like in the living world like hey oh, have you ever yeah, seen yeah, like yeah. like have you ever seen a sunset and he's like what's a sun 
Why does it suck? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That will be and, their voice from now on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then like he's always just a little bit too far away from the doorway to the living to see what that looks like. Oh. See that beauty. Oh, I and, love like, that so much. Well over, over the months and years he grows to be like obsessive. I have to see this. I want I want to see this. Like oh having a want is new to it. I love it. So yeah. He just like docks the boat, <laughs> looks at everybody and says, Stay here, you know. Don't do don't do anything crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't take the boat. <laughs> And he just, he just like walks into the land of the living, sees the sunset, like he basks in it. And is like, whoa, well, I can't leave here anymore. Like I've seen this, I've seen beauty. Oh, How could God. I return to That's what I used to do? You know? Yeah. Or what if instead of a conversation, there's like just like a super annoying kid or something on the boat and they're like, <laughs> why are you here? Don't you then die also? Like, how does this work? I don't get it. <laughs> and then they're like, oh my God, they're so annoying. And they sort of snap out of their sort of grim sort of hollow selves and become like annoyed and that means they have emotion and they're like wait what does this mean hold on why am i here (laughs) oh i could see like a short novella or like a fable where (laughs) it's just a little kid talking to the grim reaper yeah casual ghost friend there we go see full fucking circle ghost friend yeah yeah Uh, and they just sit down on a bench and they and uh, the, the the conversation casually dances around why is there a kid on this boat you know, like, oh, what happened? yeah. Oh, that's beautiful and sad. Oh. And then, like, the, the from Rupert in all of his evil, tempestuous, like, <laughs> yeah. like evilness. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. I'm losing words here. Um, has <laughs> to be evilness. very gentle. Has yeah. to be very gentle and be like, hey, like, this happened. And things oh, have, are going to change. Oh, he has to explain it. Oh. Yeah, he got to explain it. He's oh. like, oh, will I ever see, like, Shit, that's Buddy, good. my pet dog again? He's oh. like, no, oh, things like that. Worse. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Will you share this lunch with me on the bench yeah. right before the boat? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I could see that. Oh, that, that's, that's so what I'm saying. Good. The ferryman has such a different perspective on this whole situation than everybody else, and he's got to be this impartial um, medium from the yeah. from the living and the dead. So he must have so many stories. But also, like, you know? how to console someone as the ferryman? Of course. Like, do they feel sad when someone dies? Is that even a thing? It's probably not even their job. It's not his job no. to console people. It's not his job to make people feel happy about their death. Yeah. He probably never involves himself in that sort of thing. I guess not. Yeah. But then if the little kid comes up and he suddenly feels, I guess, emotion, then he has to talk to them. Like, what is that conversation yeah. even like? <laughs> like, yeah. Like the kid is like the kid is being disruptive. So it's like, <laughs> fine, let me handle this. And it becomes this kind of heartfelt conversation. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Love that. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I like that. That is a great place to kind of wrap up this episode. And that is a really fun prompt. Oh. That really. <laughs> now I'm sitting on it. Now I'm now I'm uh-huh. staring. You know, you got to write it down. I'm like, oh dang, it's in your heart. It's so good. The ferryman so conquered good. you. Yep. Hmm. Um. Yeah. But with <laughs> that, thank you for listening in. It's been a strong 14 episodes. We've yes. put out at least at least 11, 12 hours of just talking about. This love of world building, you know, this this beautiful hobby that we very much enjoy. Isn't that amazing, Dante, that we have like 14 episodes now? It's crazy. That's so it's cool. Crazy. I will, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 blowing my mind that, it, that we've gotten this far. Like usually these things fall through real soon. Yeah, but, yeah, you yeah. Know. We've been consistent about it. We've been mm-hmm, enthusiastic about. about it. We've covered all yeah. sorts of things, by the way. I'm yeah. surprised that we didn't run out of topics yet. At some point I was like, hmm, don't we like at some point like finish everything that we need to talk about when world building but <laughs> guess not because we just keep going <laughs> i think somewhere lo- halfway through i'm like wait there's so much more to talk about yeah <laughs> i feel like once you dip your toe into it and you got like all the regular stuff out of the way like main characters mm-hmm. and, i don't know fantasy tropes blah, 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 then you can like really go deep and actually talk about all the stuff that's related to you. and i love yeah. it it's so good listen i'm i'm looking forward to all of the all of the cool episodes we're coming uh, we're mm-hmm. gonna go make in the future um but we are in fact going to take a little bit of a break yeah. wrap up this season um we'll be back soon don't go anywhere actually go places i don't want you to sit here for like a month but <laughs> please <laughs> no, do, do other things, stuff you know? with your life in the meantime um, don't, yeah. don't, don't don't wait too long um but but of course when we're back and we will be back yeah yeah, uh, yeah. come join us back at the table back at the, back in front of the um the hearth Sit, sit, sit with us by the fire <laughs> uh-huh, as uh-huh, we uh, reconvene and talk about more amazing things about storytelling, about world building and all yeah. of that. So um, as we send this off and you hopefully listening to this, are just a little bit more encouraged to world build. Always, always remember. 
Your rivers are wrong. Yep. They're pretty wrong. They're still wrong. <laughs> and they will be wrong in season two. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good one. See you then. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Your Rivers Are Wrong. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes that you'd like to hear us cover, feel free to contact us at yourriversarewrong at gmail.com. Our intro and outro music is written by Maarten Schellekens. Thanks for that. And again, thank you so much for listening. We hope to see you at the next one.